There are few things as readily associated with Christmas as the Nativity. They come in all sizes, and they're made up of all sorts of materials. You can get ones made out of wood, out of plastic, you can get one inflatable ones, you can get all sorts of Nativities. And they even include live reenactments with people playing the part of Mary and Joseph and some shepherds and angels and wise men. And of course, if you're good at it, real farm animals. Or perhaps if you're trying to be cute, children dressed up as farm animals. For extra credit, you might even include an infant playing the part of the newborn Jesus. These attempts to visualize the first Christmas are a continuation of the effort that was actually begun by St. Francis of Assisi. He is the founder of the Franciscan monks. In AD 1223, so about 800 years ago, he was looking for a way to help the mostly illiterate Christian population understand the Christmas story. So he created what is believed to have been the first nativity. What he created was a live-action reenactment. We know he at least had an ox and a donkey in a cave. The sources are unclear whether or not he had people playing the parts, but he used that to tell the Christmas story to the people. Francis' original effort quickly caught on, and it spread throughout Christendom. This was an era, remember, when things like passion plays, nativity scenes, and art like stained glass windows were primary teaching tools. Because the church services were in Latin, which few people could understand. And the text of the Bible, rare and expensive to copy, even if you could get it, it was in Latin, which few people could read. Until the invention of the printing press and vernacular translations of the Bible in the 16th century, visual representations of the Bible were how most Christians learned an awful lot of what they knew about God. They were very important. And just as a side note, my wife this past week bought the Lego Bible, which is a return to that idea. The whole Bible basically spell, uh, acted out with Lego scenes that the guy put together. It's hilarious and a little bit disturbing at times, but uh, visually seeing the Bible. The idea of the nativity scene has a strong connection to our text today in John 1.14. As the Gospel author focuses upon the physical reality of the incarnation of Jesus, that moment when the internal Word of God became flesh and blood as a small child placed in a manger. So let's look at 1 John 1.14. We'll read the whole verse, then we'll break it down into different parts. So let me read the verse. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So let's start with the first part. The Word became flesh. This moment, this one moment, is the pivot point of all of human history. The moment when the creator of everything stepped into that creation and became a part of it. In verse 1, a couple weeks ago, John had established the eternal and divine nature of the Word of God. We looked at that. That was a lofty claim, a lofty claim when it is coupled with this verse, where the same word is equated with the child born of Mary, who would one day walk those dusty roads of Judea as a traveling rabbi. Thus John has made two claims for Jesus, one spiritual and divine, the other physical and human. Both of them are fully necessary to John's presentation of the Gospel. Neither can be separated out if the mission of Jesus is to be counted upon. It is this unique, and by unique I mean never before occurring and never since, because it won't happen again. It is a unique combination of human and divine that enables Jesus to become much more than any previous prophet or priest or king could ever have been. Throughout the history of the Church, there have been sporadic attempts that have been successfully resisted each and every time to water down either Jesus' 
divinity or his humanity by casting doubt upon John's assertion that both natures are fully present in Jesus. That such a combination of two natures in one person is a miracle is clear. Then again, so is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. To have a Christian faith is to believe in God's ability and willingness to do that which to us is miraculous. Those who do not accept the full humanity and divinity of Jesus do not accept the gospel he proclaimed. Why is that? Very simple reason. Because our faith is in the Son of God, who is also the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. If we do not believe who he was, how can we believe what he said and what he did? There's nothing unusual about the verb that John uses here uh, that is translated as became. It is simply the to be verb in Greek. You use it all the time. It's all over the New Testament. It was the same verb that he used back in verse 1 when John wrote that the word was God, just past tense. Now the word has become flesh, present tense. It is a change in the state of being of the eternal word, who was not flesh and blood before. He was God and with God. We saw that in verse 1. Now he has also become that which we are, human. Notice that John is leaving here no room for those who would say that Jesus only appeared to be divine or human, or for those who might say that the divine or human aspect was only temporary, like a garment that he put on and then took off again. That isn't it at all. The word became flesh. The noun that John, John used to, that we translate here as flesh is also an ordinary word used to describe both our physical bodies and our human nature. Those are the two things that define our existence. We exist in both space and time within these bodies, these physical bodies, and yet are much more than the sum of our parts because of the mind and the soul that we've been given by our Creator. We've been given gifts that, have, that leave us with a will of our own and a capacity to create. We have emotions, we can love. All of these things make up what it is to be human. Throughout his life, Jesus will experience the pleasures and pains of having a physical body, and with it, its limitations as he is for the first time limited by space and time, for the first time experiencing things like hunger and pain, but also the warmth of an embrace. Jesus will experience what it is like to make choices in both practical and moral situations when you're limited. Now, Jesus will often utilize his divine power to help those in need or demonstrate his authority. We see that throughout the Gospels. But he didn't live life here as some sort of invulnerable superman. When they lashed his back and drove nails through his wrists, that pain was as real for him as it would be for you. So the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is the immediate benefit of the Word becoming flesh. God can now dwell with His people in a more tangible way than ever before. It is also the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah when he predicted that the virgin's child would be called Emmanuel, a Hebrew name that means God with us. The prophets had often spoke of God's promise of sending Messiah, an anointed one, who would be the deliverer of his people. Yet, yet even they may not have conceived that God's chosen messenger would be his only son, that he would in fact be God himself. The phrase, made his dwelling among us, could also be translated with a word that has resonance with the people of Israel. It is a word used to describe the portable dwelling place of God prior to Solomon's temple, and that word is tabernacle. God had tabernacled with his people by having his glory present 
within the Holy of Holies, between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. This glory was virtually unapproachable for the people because its holiness was not in any way veiled, and therefore it would have been deadly for any unclean and sinful person to attempt to approach it by entering the sacred place. In fact, only the high priest could enter there, and he could only do so once a year on the Day of Atonement when he brought the annual sin offering. So God was pre previously dwelling with his people in a removed and remote way. But notice how much that setup contrasts with the ability to approach Jesus, a man who welcomes little children, who eats dinner with tax collectors and sinners, and who reaches out to touch the untouchable lepers. To continue that theme, Jesus allows the sinful woman to wash his feet with her tears before pouring perfume on them, and later on washes his, the feet of his disciples. He even offers Thomas his hands and his side after the resurrection to touch and believe. The unveiled glory of God was almost un entirely unapproachable, yet the glory of God within Christ Jesus is open to everyone who is willing to come to him. Among us is also a reminder that John was an eyewitness to so much of what is recorded in the Gospels. He spent years with Jesus, sharing meals, having conversations, watching Jesus minister and learning from him. Their relationship was a very deep friendship, more like that of a brother, that kind of love, and yet added to it the respect that you feel towards your mentor, your teacher. Because Jesus came to dwell among us, the gap, the gap between God, who is holy, and mankind, which is sinful, was bridged by the Son of Man, who, like God, was without sin. Just prior to his passion, Jesus promised his disciples that even though he will soon be leaving them to return to his Father, they will not be left alone. Beginning at Pentecost, the Spirit of God began to dwell within all those who follow Jesus, a further commitment by God that would ensure that his dwelling will always be among us. The last part of the verse, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. It is important for us to understand that Jesus is the Word of God, that he existed with God and was God prior to the Incarnation, and that he truly became human when he took on the flesh of humanity. This understanding of Jesus is the most important fact of history. Of all the things you ever learned about that happened on this planet before you were born, this is the most important one. Why? Well, it isn't because knowledge of facts alone about God will be sufficient to save us. We're not playing here a cosmic game of Jeopardy, where all you need to do is be able to answer the final Jeopardy question, what is the true dual nature of Jesus of Nazareth? That is not our purpose. Our knowledge about Jesus is crucial because it opens up our understanding about the mission that the Father sent His Son to accomplish. And it is that mission's success that demands a response from us. This last third of verse 14 reflects that mission and response that the nature of Jesus made possible with its mention of glory, grace, and truth. Let's look at all three. Beginning with the glory. The glory of God revealed many times through Jesus throughout his life here on earth is the first thing we need to realize about our condition. How does the glory of God illuminate anything about who we are? It shows us how far we, as humanity, have fallen from our Creator's original design. When we look upon the perfection of God, it highlights our imperfection. When we glimpse the holiness of God, it reminds us of our sinfulness. And when we gaze in wonder at the power of God, it convinces us how truly powerless 
we really are. Jesus, by walking amongst us and demonstrating the entirely unique glory of God, confirmed a truth we already knew in our hearts, that we fall far short of the glory of God. He came from the Father full of grace and truth. The truth can hurt. That's one reason why a lot of people prefer to believe a lie, even if they know it's a lie. The truth of the glory of God, a truth that come, that, excuse me, that removes any false bravado, any false pride from us. That truth is devastating. It would have less, left us with despair if not for the way in which that glory was revealed to us. It came from the Father, through the Son, who was sent here to solve the very dilemma that His holiness was making evident to us. Jesus didn't come to show us God's glory and then leave us to our fate. He came here to show God's glory in order to wake us up to wake up the slumbering, false sense of security that we have, not only to show us the way to fix the problem, but to be the way to fix the problem. That is where the grace comes in, the grace that Jesus brought with him. Yes, our situation is dire because of how far short of the glory of God humanity has sunk, but no, our situation is not hopeless. Because God's response to humanity's plight is an act of grace, a crucial step of which was the birth of the Christ child. Later on, by his teaching and his actions, Jesus will show time and time again that God doesn't want to condemn humanity. He wants to reconcile humanity to him. That is why Jesus had no patience for self-righteous people who thought they didn't need God's help. No patience at all for them, but endless patience for anyone who came to him ready to receive God's mercy. Those who knew they were sinners in need of God's grace found Jesus ready to welcome them home with open arms. Those who thought they were too good to associate with sinners, they actually made Jesus angry. Grace is a gift. Those who scorn it for themselves and try to keep it from others by declaring them to be too sinful to be forgiven will themselves one day be judged by God. And it won't go well for them. Lastly, the truth. The truth that Jesus brought with him was the solution that God offers. His glory revealed the problem. His grace set a solution in motion. And the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus made it all possible. Once we realize that we cannot measure up to God and admit we need His grace to save us, the question then becomes, how will God's grace be applied to me? The answer lies with the one who was both God and man. As a representative of both, Jesus is the mediator who can bridge the gap between God's holiness and man's sinfulness. It is this truth that our hope must be in Jesus, that truth, our hope must be in Jesus, that the fact of Christmas points us toward, and that truth demands a response from us, a response of faith. When we place our trust in Jesus, we experience God's forgiveness, we, let, we begin the process of becoming like our brother Jesus as newly adopted members of the family of God. So here we are at Christmas, nearly so anyway. Christmas is a celebration, a time of joy to remember that God decided to dwell among us, not just as, as an example to us, but also as the way for us. And for that reason, we will continue to celebrate Christmas each and every year, for it revealed to us the glory, the grace, and the truth of God.